Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Gabe. I am an alcoholic. I'm not going to need that thing in a minute. I can tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. What happened was, is I, uh, I drank a lot of booze, and I got in a lot of trouble. I did things that men shouldn't do. I did things that human beings shouldn't do. I come from a family of ten kids. I was number nine out of ten. As a nine-year-old boy, I used to hide in the closet with my little brothers and sisters and hold them while my mom and dad fought in their drunken stupidity. And I grew up real scared. Real scared. Seventeen years old, the judge decided it was time for me to go someplace else, and, and he gave me a choice between the United States Army and some, somewhere else, and I joined the United States Army. And I did a lot of really interesting things for a few years in the Army, things that I would never, ever, ever be able to explain, show, or tell about because they were beautiful. I got to jump out of airplanes and blow things up all over the world. <laughs> you know, and I drank myself out of a really beautiful career that, that most men never get a chance to have. I came back to San Diego and I was going to go on unemployment and live at the beach and surf and drink beer. And uh, I was living with my mom and dad for a minute and I stayed there for about three days and I had to get a job because I couldn't live with them still. just didn't work. And uh, I got a job. And I went into this bar called the Hammershot Junction. I saw this pretty green-eyed girl behind the bar. And I fell in love. And uh, she's the mother of my child. I have a 23-year-old son that's never seen me drunk. I got sober on the last last Friday of February of 1991. I've never seen it fit, never seen it fit to drink since then. About a year after we got married, she laid out some information about Alcoholics Anonymous on a table. And I was drinking under the stairwell before I went in the house because I couldn't drink inside the house. She wouldn't allow me to. And this little, this big old man used to walk by and he goes, that looks really promising. That looks really good. Are you having fun? <laughs> and the reason I mentioned that old man, because after I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, my third meeting, he was there and he had 32 years of sobriety. And one morning I woke up and that incomprehensible demoralization slapped me in the head so hard. I looked in the mirror and I became the man I never, ever wanted to be. That woman I married, I didn't take her as a wife, I took her as a hostage. I'd get drunk and be stupid and break things, throw things. Never touched her physically, thank God. But the emotional damage I did to that woman is still healing. 25 years later, I can guarantee you that. We raised a beautiful child together. And we love each other today as mother and father. And the program Alcoholics Anonymous gave that to me. The men and women in this program, when I got here the first day and that little old lady at central office, I dialed 265-8762. For you that are new to Alcoholics Anonymous, that's a number to our central office. That's a lifeline. And that little old lady told me to go to a meeting around the corner from my house. And I walked into that meeting at noon, and a little little bitty Mexican fellow by the name of Frank Trujillo looked over at me and he went like that and he sat me down in a chair and he patted me on the shoulder and he said everything's going to be okay and he gave me half a cup of coffee so I wouldn't spill it and I listened to him and they said their spill and I didn't understand a damn thing they were saying and after the meeting that little old man walked up to me and he put his hand on my shoulder again he says son everything's going to be okay I promise just be back here at 6 o'clock tonight and you know, I had a loaded pistol on the seat of the pickup truck I drove over there on. And if that old man wouldn't have said that to me, I would have blown my brains out in that parking lot that day. That's where I was at. I had the gift of desperation like I had never seen before in my life of anything I'd ever done. I could no longer drink enough to get drunk. I could not drink enough to die, and I was too scared to pull the trigger myself. And that little old man with 30-some years of sobriety told me it was going to be okay. And nobody had told me that in a long time. A long time. You know, and I went back to that meeting at 6 o'clock that night, and I listened to what they had to say, and I still didn't know what they were saying. 
But I listened to them. And there were a few other guys there at 6 o'clock. You know, and a couple of those guys are in the room tonight. And they spewed their spew and their tough guidance, and they told me the way it was. And I started looking around. I was listening to those stories, and I went, my God, these guys are sick. Because <laughs> I'm looking for any reason not to come back here. And, you know, after the meeting, the old boy told me, he says, you come back tomorrow. we got another meeting. And I did that for a couple of weeks. I just went back to the meetings, and I didn't drink between the meetings. Because this old man, Bruce Robinson, God bless his soul, he told me on the third night, he said, the way we do this, son, is we go to meetings, and we don't drink between the meetings. You're not smart enough for anything else just yet. (laughs) And I did exactly what he said, you know. And I went to the meetings and I didn't drink between them for a couple of days. You know, and, and, I, and I had something to say one night. And the old man looked over at me and he says, Gabe, just sit down and shut up. You ain't got nothing we need to hear. And I was like, wow, that's kind of arrogant, right? How do they know? I'm hurting. I'm dying inside. I got all kinds of things to say. You know, but after the meeting, them old boys take you up to Coco's. And, you know, they put you in a booth, and they put you in the corner, and then two sit on this side and two sit on this side. You're not going nowhere. And then they ask you what's going on in your life. What did you want to say in that meeting? And you spew it out. My wife hates me. I feel like shit. Everything's coming apart at the seams. I can't quit drinking, but I want it so bad. I don't want to drink, but I want to drink, and I don't know what to do with it. And them old men sit there and they talk to you night after night like that. You know, night after night. And I kept meeting these men that were sober and listening to these women that were sober, they said. And I thought they just weren't drinking at the meetings. I didn't know. I really didn't know when I got here. In 1984, I was arrested for DUI and a judge sent me to court and I walked into an AA meeting and he sent me to 14 AA meetings. I walked into an AA meeting and I... North Carolina, and there's a bunch of old crusty people smoking cigarettes and telling stories and holding on to their books. And I walked back out, and I went back to the clerk of the court the next day, and I said, what do I got to do to get out of those AA meetings? And she said, well, you got to talk to the judge. So I went and talked to the judge, and I asked that judge, I said, what do I got to do to get out of those meetings? And he says, you can do 14 days in jail. I said, well, I'm going to go get leave. I'll be back on Monday to serve 14 days because I wasn't coming here because I wasn't like those people. You know, my ego was so big. And all those years later, I end up in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and things start to make sense a little bit after a couple of days. And then you know, I was there about two weeks, and, and Bruce walks over, and he goes, have you got a big book? And I says, no. And the meeting's giving him away, right? And he goes, well, go up there and get one. And I went up and got it, and I turned around and walked off. He said, did you pay for that? I said, no, the meeting's giving it to me. He says, you got a job? I said, yeah. He says, go back and pay for it. You know, we give the meeting, we give the book to the to the person that needs it. You know, that seventh tradition is very, very important. You know, without that seventh tradition, this meeting doesn't doesn't exist. Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't exist. You know, they Bill Wilson and all those guys back in the old days when they took this when they when they built this program, they went they got five of the richest guys in the United States together and said, Hey, we need money to make this thing go. You know, and it was Rockefeller and a few other dudes and they got together in a room and Bill gave his spiel to get all this money for Alcoholics Anonymous. And old man Ford and Rockefeller stood up and they laid a dollar bill on the table and they said, if you ever take more than that from anybody outside of this program, it will fail. And that's where that seventh tradition came from. It's that important to us that we, that we put our money in that basket. I quit drinking 25 years ago. Crown Royal was $2.25 a drink. <laughs> You guys that are in here new in the last few years, you know, I go out with friends that drink, and I buy drinks for them every once in a while. A bottle of beer, $7? Think about it. We're saving money. Because how many people ever went out and drank one beer a night? (laughs) If you did, you wouldn't be in this seat. You just wouldn't be in this seat. An old boy gave me, you know, I read that book, and I started reading it, and I started getting enlightened, and... And, and, and I didn't understand a damn thing I was reading. It was black and white stuff on a page. And, and uh, this old boy says, how far are you through that book? And I said, I read the first 164 pages. And, and he said, good. He said, now come on over to the house and let's get to work. And we sat down and things started happening. It, it, was, it was the damnedest thing I've ever seen in my life. 
you know, we did this and we did this and we did this. And he says, do you believe that I believe? And I said, yeah. He says, now get on your knees. And I got down on my knees and we did a third step prayer. And he said, turn the page. And I turned the page and it says, you launched into a vigorous course of action. A vigorous course of action. You know? And I went home and I read that and I'm looking at those 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 columns and I'm going, what am I going to do? You know, so me being the brainiac I am, I wrote all that stuff down right away, you know, and had a couple of pages and I went back to him the next day. I said, I got it done. And he says, that isn't what the book said. Because the book says you make a column and then there's a period. And me and my infinite wisdom, you know, I wrote down my wife for making me go to AA and everything else she'd ever done to me. And I went right across the board and I had like a page and a half just on her. And he explained to me why those columns are there and why we do them by column. Because if you're sitting there with somebody in your head and you start writing that stuff down, you got, you, you got an autobiography going. And if you do it in the columns, you know you've got about 10 or 15 others you've got to take care of, so you're not going to waste the ink. And me being a lazy alcoholic, I wasn't going to write that much. You know, and they stepped me through that book. They spoon fed me Alcoholics Anonymous. I always say they tricked me into doing the steps because I wasn't smart enough to realize what they were doing to me. And they spoon fed me Alcoholics Anonymous that way. And it was quick. It was quick. You know, I remember about 120 days. I remember, you know, you need to be doing this today. You see that guy that just walked in the door? You need to be on him. You need to be on him. You know, and today I hear people all the time say, oh, don't worry about the steps. We'll get to them later. Oh, you can find God next year. You don't worry about finding God. You know, the first 40, 50 pages of Alcoholics Anonymous, this beautiful book, that beautiful book is all about finding God. And if you've got a problem with God and you don't like me saying God, I'm sorry. But either you find God or you die. And those aren't my words. Those words come directly out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. God is the only thing a spiritual experience is the only thing that will help a true alcoholic, the real alcoholic. That book says it over and over and over again. And I was like, damn, because I knew there wasn't a God. It's, you know, I, I, the things I went through in my life, you know, at 17 years old, I had to do it. I had to commit a commit an act that no human being should ever have to commit. And I did it several times after. And you got to live with that. You know, and I, I had broken all 10 commandments at that point. All Ten Commandments were done at that point. And I knew God would never save me. But the beautiful part about it is the God of my understanding. Not a light bulb, not a doorknob. You know, I didn't want my God to be a doorknob because all of you touched that doorknob on the way out. <laughs> you know, I don't need a God that dirty. Just, I need something, something a whole lot cleaner than I was at the point. You know, and I went through those steps and I did what I was supposed to do. You know, I, I I got into service work at 90 days sober, started answering phones at simple at sinful office. You know, with at at nine o'clock in the morning until one o'clock in the afternoon, and 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 what a blessing to sit down and listen to them sick people call. You know, I need help. I want somebody to talk to. I'm drinking myself to death. Or the wife call. I'm going to kill him if somebody doesn't get here. <laughs> you know, those 12 step calls I went on. You know, the old boy used to call me. At 11, I, was, I was like 35 days sober, and this old boy calls me at 11:15 at night. I'm laying in bed sleeping. And he says, get in the driveway. I'll be there in a half hour. I said, it's 11.15 at night. He said, did you drink at night? I said, yeah. He says, get in the driveway. <laughs> you know, and I, and, I, and I get down in the driveway and I jump in that big old Cadillac and, and, and down the road we go, you know, and there's three of us in there. And I said, what am I going to do? I'm only 30 some days sober. I don't know nothing yet. He says, just shut up and come on. You're going to watch. You know, and I did. And when I got there, you know, all hell was broken loose in that house. And he says, you grab the wife, and she's got a frying pan about that big around. You're going to hurt this guy at the dinner table. He says, you take her in the other room and calm her down, and we're going to talk to him. You know, and I took her in the other room, and I did my thing, and those boys talked to him, and they got him to agree to go get a hotel room and let things mellow out and go to a meeting the next day. You know, and, and then we got into really 12 step and call a couple months later. We were going down to Market Street. This was the coolest stuff in the world I ever did in Alcoholics Anonymous. We'd go down to Market Street on a Friday night and we'd roll up a drunk laying in the gutter. We'd pick him up, we'd throw him in that Cadillac, and we'd haul him over across town and do our deal with him. Get him cleaned up, give him food, do the whole nine yards. And on Monday, Sunday, Sunday, Monday, 
Right, right, Larry? That the way Jules did it? Sunday or Monday, kick them back on the street if they wanted to go back? Yeah. <laughs> you know? It was amazing stuff. And somebody told me that wasn't 12-step and that was kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell did I know? <laughs> so I quit doing it. So I quit doing it. You know, and then I kept going through these steps. And, and you know, you, you get to that fifth step and... You write that four step all out and all them wrongs and everything and you do all them resentments and you sit down with a guy and, you know, I invited the guy over to the house and I made a steak and the whole nine yards and really trying to impress this old boy. And we sat down at the table and we ate the steak and dessert and the whole nine and he says, all right, you ready to do this? And I said, yeah. And I read all that to him and told him everything I needed to tell him and he says, is that all? And I was crushed. I thought it was so important that what do you mean, that's all? And he looked across the table and he says, Gabe, you know, these are the things we do. We don't have control over. This is what our lives lead to. But I found out I was self-centered and I was selfish. That I was an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. You know? And I found out all these things. And we did our deal and he left and he said, you sit alone and read that read that book and see what it says next. And, you know, you sit alone and you go back over things and see what you missed, and you do your deal. And then you got to ask God to humbly remove all your defects of character. And, and the guy was so nice when I was telling him that fourth and fifth step, he wrote down all my defects of character for me. So I'd have a list to ask to be removed. You know, he, he was that nice to me. <laughs> You know, and I asked for those to be removed, and they're being removed slowly. 25 years later, I can tell you, I can bring any one of them back at any God-given time I want to. At any God-given time I want to. You know, and then you make those leather lists, and you do the deal you gotta do, and... Thank you. You do the deal you gotta do, and... Then you gotta go out and make all those amends after you make that list of people you harmed. And I was like, well, they really don't deserve me to say sorry to them. And I've said it enough to them over the years. Why should I do it? They said, do you want a drink? And I said, no. And they said, if you don't do it, you will get drunk. This book says so. And every time I said something, those guys always said, this book says so. It wasn't their opinion. It wasn't something that somebody told them. It was out of the book. You know, so I made that list and I went out and I set out to, to make these apologies and some of them were accepted really well. Some of them were, you know, good for you. I hope it works. Don't ever talk to me again. You know, and I had to accept that. I had to accept that. But the biggest amend I think I ever made when I first got sober was to myself. You know, and when the guy told me that, I was like, what? And he put it real simple. He said, if anybody in the world would have done to you what you did to yourself, what would you have done? I'd have shot him. If any of you had done the things I'd done to myself, I would have shot you. It's that simple. But I didn't realize that. You know, and then you do the 10, 11, and 12, and you, and you, you get that spiritual experience. And, and God enters your life. And then they say, go. Go find somebody and get to work. You know? And, you know, I'm going to say this because you haven't heard me mention the word sponsor up here yet tonight. And I know it's really big in Alcoholics Anonymous. In 25 years of sobriety, I've never had a sponsor. But I have six men that I answer to. Because they believe the big book Alcoholics Anonymous says I need a closed, a closed mouth friend. Somebody that I trust. And I trusted these men. You know, all these men were convicts. They were Vietnam vets. Second World War vets. These guys were the deal when I got here. They're the only ones that understood me. And they show me, you know, you see a watch, they used to tell me, you know, watch the sponsors and the sponsees in the meetings. The sponsor says, my sponsee doesn't call me every day. My sponsee doesn't do this. My sponsee doesn't do that. And that's what it sounds like to me. It's boasting, it's bragging, it's whining. You know, and the sponsee says, my sponsor says, my sponsor says, my sponsor says, show me in the book what it means. I'm a book guy. You know, I have no idea what that book says from, from one page to the next, 25 years later. All I know is that I can find the answer for an alcoholic inside that book because I found it. And if I can find it, anybody can. You know, the big book's Alcoholics Anonymous talks, excuse me. The big book Alcoholics Anonymous talks about powerless one time. 
it one time. Yet you walk into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and all you hear is, I'm powerless, I'm powerless, I can't do that, I'm powerless. Really? We get our power back if we work these steps and we have a spiritual experience. The big book Alcoholics Anonymous, I think it's over 30 times, says we get our power back. You know, I sit in these meetings all these years later and I hear all this powerless stuff. Whatever happened to giving your power, getting your power back? When did we quit teaching the newcomer, you're going to get your power back? You know, you're going to be able to stand on your own two feet, walk into a liquor store, buy a soda pop, and walk out. When did we quit preaching that? You know, I do a lot of 12-step work. I think I'm the only man at Central Office on the phone list that has any time next to his name. So I've been told. We have 1,028 meetings, you say, in San Diego County a week, right? There's 120 people on the 12-step list. There's 48 meetings represented at the Coordinating Council. Now, the Coordinating Council makes the decisions for Alcoholics Anonymous in San Diego. How lame is it that we only have 48 people doing those things? So when you're sitting in a meeting and you're bitching because A, Central spent money somewhere, and you haven't been a part of that Coordinating Council, and you didn't, your group didn't check it out, Say something. Let's get a coordinator. I've done every bit of service work there is in Alcoholics Anonymous in San Diego. There's not one job that I have not performed in 25 years. Because the old dude said, first we started picking up ashtrays and cleaning them. Then we started, you know, the ABCs, ashtrays, brooms, and chairs, back in the old days. You know? And that's where they started you at. At my men's meeting in La Mesa that we started after, they started two weeks before I got sober and I've been there religiously for 25 years plus. We designed it when it got started and we, we started this meeting, we designed it to where the secretary became the secretary at six months, for six months to get a year. We designed it so our coffee maker did the coffee for six months so he could become the secretary. We set the meeting up so it would succeed. And those old dudes used to think about that stuff. And that's what I was taught. People get mad at me all the time. They say, you know, Gabe, you can't tell people they're going to die. And I, it's not that I'm telling people they're going to die. I'm telling you, if you don't do this, that's it. Insanity or death. It's that simple. You know, and, and, and I'm very passionate about Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, I get into these meetings today and I, I listen to people talk about, you know, um, Everything but Alcoholics Anonymous. Take a drunk into an AA meeting. Take an active drunk into an AA meeting today and see what happens. You know, I walk into meetings with a drunk and I got a little bottle of whiskey or, or nowadays it's 99 bananas. I smelled that crap. I ain't about to drink it. You know, and you keep that in your pocket because you got to spoon feed them a little bit to keep them from seizing out. You know, that's what they taught us. You teach them that stuff. Jules used to run around with a half pint in his pocket or in the trunk of his car all the time. Gabe, go get that. You know, and help that dude out. Will remembers. You know, we do those things. You know, nowadays I think the alcoholic finds his bottom way too soon. You know, the, I got a guy I've been working with for six years. I ain't been working with this guy. He calls me when he needs a ride to the hospital. Who am I lying to? <laughs> <laughs> now watch this man die twice in the last six years. His drinking bins consist of a Friday night and a case of rock gut fists in a motel room and a carton of cigarettes. And he drinks it until he either starts puking blood or he can't drink anymore and he can't get drunk anymore. And then he calls and says, I need a ride to the hospital. And I've been going and getting this man repeatedly over the years for the last six years and taking him to the hospital. I've seen his blood alcohol content at a .62, and he was walking. You know, and it's amazing to me, amazing to me. People say, why do you do it, Gabe? Because there for the grace of God go I. That kid drinks, drinks the way I did, exactly the way I did. You know, and we don't give up on these people. We don't give up on them. And this kid's got a desperation to not drink. He really honestly, truly does. He wants to not drink so bad it is, it is, it's, 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 it's mind boggling to me. And he'll get three months, six months, nine months, and he'll drink again. 
And he doesn't pick up just a half a pint when he starts drinking again. He goes right back to that case of vodka every time. You know, and it may not do him any good when I'm there, but it does me good every time I go. I was married to a beautiful woman for a number of years and sober, and she died a year and a half ago or so of cancer. The night before she died, this idiot called, and she knew she was dying. And I told her it was Chad, and she says, you know what, go get him, he needs you. Because she knew that this program means that much to me. She knows in my darkest hour, right then and there, when she's, when she's prepared to pass, my darkest hour, the only thing that's going to save me is a newcomer. She had been around. We have taken people into our home over the years together. We had fed them, clothed them, taken care of them until we could get them somewhere they needed to be. Because that's what we're supposed to do. She was beautiful that way. You know? I locked a guy in a horse trailer one time. He had, seven, he had to have 72 hours <laughs> to be in the Freedom Ranch. And a buddy of mine called me and says, he's got to have 72 hours sober, but we don't know how to do it. And this kid says, Gabe, I'll do anything to stay sober for 72 hours so I can get in the Freedom Ranch. And I got to thinking, and the only thing I could think of was to bring him to my house. I lived up in camp on 100 acres and in a, in a ranch up there. I said, the only thing I could think of was bring him up there and put him in a horse trader for three days. <laughs> And I just an honest engine. And I called George. I told him what I was going to do. And he said, try it. <laughs> you never make a decision without asking another alcoholic. <laughs> fun stuff happens. <laughs> and you know, this kid was so willing. He stayed in that horse trader for 72 hours. And he went to the Freedom Ranch. Today, he's a successful young man in the United States Marine Corps. You know, it paid off. But on the other hand, some of them 12-step calls, you know, we've been out and we cut men out of rafters. And we cleaned up the mess so their kids didn't have to see it. You know, the big book Alcoholics Anonymous talks about a shipwreck. And we become these instant friends and we're all comrades and we're all doing this together. You know, when you think about a shipwreck, you ever look at one of them big luxury liners? How many lifeboats are on that thing compared to the people? Not enough. We never talk about the ones that didn't make it. We never, ever talk about the ones that didn't make it in that shipwreck. You know, and I, sometimes I like to think of them, because if it wasn't for them, some of these seats, I wouldn't have a seat in a lot of rooms if them people didn't make it. You know, and give a guy the reason to go through the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, to try to save a life. First, starting with your own. You know, the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, starts out talking about a flimsy reed and the desperation of a drowning man. And when you look at it and you come to your senses, it was the hand of God. The loving, caring hand of God. That little bitty hope when that old man put his hand on my shoulder and said, it's going to be okay. That was my flimsy read. I know that today from the bottom of my heart. You know, and you read that book and it talks a little while later, it talks about this cornerstone that we put in place. And it's about faith. It's a cornerstone in which we're going to build a structure of spirituality that we're going to live in. You know, the big book Alcoholics Anonymous explains that stuff. hundred dead dudes. And before you start the steps, they go off to say, we beg of you. We beg of you. That's a huge, huge thing for a hundred people I don't know that are already dead to beg me to do something. And if it worked for them, who do I say? Who am I to say it doesn't? The book says God is everything or God is nothing. And a little while later it says, who am I to say there is no God? You know, these are the things that the old dudes fed me and they showed me. You know, and my, and, 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 and my spiritual awakening wasn't some big bright light and tadas and, and unicorns and stuff. It was, it was that first alcoholic that I went, that I went out and 12 stepped by myself. That first guy that I went and talked to. And you know, that first guy that I went and talked to, his name's Jim. And him and I were best drinking buddies. And a year after I got sober and had done this deal the way I was supposed to, he called me from county jail January 1st. And he says, Gabe, I'm in county jail. I said, yeah, I kind of got the collect call down. I, I know where they come from. <laughs> and he asked me if I'd come and get him. And I called the dude in the program, and I said, listen, i got this buddy of mine who's in county. What do you think? He says, go get him. 
said, whatever you do, do not tell him about Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, get him something to eat, take care of him, square him away. And that's what I did. And I took him home and dropped him off. And a couple days later, he called. He said, hey, let's go to lunch. And we got to talk. And he says, okay, you drank like I did and I drank like you do. How did you do this? And I said, you know, Jim, I said, I sat with a bunch of old dudes that knew what they were doing that said they drink like I did and they showed me how not to drink. I said, it's a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, you've got to decide whether you want to drink or not drink. You've got to decide whether you're, whether you are at the end of your rope. Nobody else can do it. And I went out to my pickup truck and I grabbed the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and I opened it up and I slid the doctor's opinion over to him and I said, read that and see what you think. And he looked at me and he said, all right, I'll do it. I said, okay, Wednesday night at 715, be there in La Mesa. That man hasn't had a drink today since that day. Because I did what the old guys said. It's simple. It's real simple. You know, the program Alcoholics Anonymous had a 100% success rate when it first started. A 100% success rate. It says in the book, 75% stayed, 25% went back, and then they came back and they stayed. Today they say it's, I don't know, right? Piss poor. Why, is, why, why are we losing people? Why is our success rate so far down? These are the things I ask. I mean, I'm not going to tell you some big war story about my whole life. I'm not going to sit here and talk about that stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that matters to me and to the newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous. If people don't talk to you about this stuff, they're not doing you any justice. You know, I tell people all the time when they come up to me and say, Gabe, I got a sponsor and I'm working the steps. And I said, you know, if they tell you to do something, it's not in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If they can't show you in the first 164 pages where it says do it, do not do it. I'm telling you. That's an opinion. And we all got two of those, right? Opinion and a what? Yeah. Exactly. You know? And, and I'm not trying to be real heavy. I'm just tired of watching people die. I've buried so many people in Alcoholics Anonymous in the last 25 years, it's ridiculous. Needless deaths because their sponsor told them, go sit on a rock and meditate. You know, you don't, you know, let's do this instead. You know? Oh, what, what are, what are my favorite ones? We're going to write out your first step. Yeah. How do you write out a first step? <laughs> you know, they talk about being unmanageable, your life being unmanageable. That's the very first step. People come in, oh, I don't, my car payment's due, it's going to get rid of my car's leaving, my wife's leaving, the dog's leaving, my kids are leaving. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but that does not make your life unmanageable. That's not what they're talking about. It has nothing to do with being unmanageable. The things that are unmanageable right here, that thinking that I can't, I'm going to pick up a drink knowing where it's going to lead. Knowing where it's going to lead, and I'm going to do it anyway. And every morning I say, I'm not going to do it again. You know, it's that simple. We don't talk about that stuff anymore. When I got here, that's all they talked about. If it didn't come out of the big book, the old dudes didn't say it. You know, they didn't have any ideas. Their best ideas got them here. You know, and... And that's how I did it. I, I went to these meetings and I, and, I, and, I, and I did the steps with the old dudes and I did the 12-step calls. You know, Will and I sat in a men's meeting years ago and this old dude was standing at the podium and he was talking and, you know, they were all old dudes back then. And, you know, and nobody was listening. He fires a pistol off through the ceiling. You know? <laughs> Shut up, I'm talking. You know? Little old lady in South Bay Pioneers would grab you by the ear. First time I walked in there... Jewel sent me down there, and that little old lady grabbed me by the ear, and she goes, I've never seen you before. Come here. Sit down and be quiet. Well, actually, she didn't say be quiet, but, you know. Why don't we spoon, why don't we spoon feed Alcoholics Anonymous to the new guy anymore? Why don't we get in the book, you know? Why don't we do that anymore? Why, 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 why don't we sit down with the newcomer and read the book? Let's do this. Let's save a life. If nothing else, save your own. You know, these women, they've been coming to me for the last few years, and they go, Gabe, my sponsor wants me to write down every man I slept with, every position, and where. Why? Why? That isn't what the big book says. The big book asked me in my sexual inventory, it asked me why I was doing it, 
who I hurt doing it, and what were my motives. doesn't say any of that stuff. And I've watched women leave Alcoholics Anonymous because of that crap. I've watched them. I've watched people in Alcoholics Anonymous want to give you a, give, give people mental test. I'm going to test you to see if you're this, this mentally ill or this mentally ill or this mentally ill. You know? Stay away from it. It happens. It happens. You know? One of the greatest ones is, 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 oh, you know what? If you're going to be stone cold sober, don't take your medications from your doctor. That's not sobriety. Our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous actually says it's none of our damn business. You know? And we need to be there. We need to be there for these newcomers. You know, we got, we got competition today with BBA. You know? Whatever it is. <laughs> I had a new guy ask me a couple weeks ago. We were, my girlfriend and I were at coffee and, and this kid says, he says, so Gabe, do you think I ought to do Alcoholics Anonymous the BBA way or out of the generic big book way? The generic big book. The original writing of a hundred people that found a way to stay sober. Now, how the hell is that generic? They did what Dr. Silkworth could not do. One of the, one of the greatest minds on the planet of alcoholism couldn't figure it out. And that dude went to him and told him, you know, I found God and I ain't been able to, and I, and I found religion and I quit drinking. This is how I'm doing it. And he shared it with another dude and he shared it with another dude and here we are today. Here we are. The Alcoholics Anonymous is on a decline today, whether you know it or not. It's getting smaller. For the first time in history, Alcoholics Anonymous is getting smaller. We're not keeping the alcoholic in Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. I watch them leave every week for meetings. They get pissed off. They get mad. Their feelings get hurt. Because they're telling them to do things that are not in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, that book was designed to protect all of you from me. You know, I've had a guy for the last year and a half, he got sober, and he's been trying to fight, he's been trying to prove me wrong for the last year and a half. <laughs> I love it. Stay sober out of resentment. <laughs> Stay sober out of resentment. You know? It's fine with me. But he hasn't been able to do it because when I talk, I come from the Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's real. You know, they, there's this new thing in, excuse me, one second. This is the new excuse in Alcoholics Anonymous I find in a lot of meetings I go to. It says in there, in Alcoholics Anonymous, in the book, it says that this will help a lot of people other than alcoholics. There's some passage in there, and I'm paraphrasing, excuse me, and forgive me. But it says this will be beneficial to other people than alcoholics. Well, the new guys all think that that means we get to cover everybody's illness. I've watched more heroin addicts die in the last six months in Alcoholics Anonymous than I care to see. And you know why? Because we think we can help them. We have a primary purpose to stay sober and help another alcoholic to achieve sobriety. We are not God. And if you're a heroin addict, God bless you. But I'm going to tell you for your own safety, and if you want to live, get the hell away from Alcoholics Anonymous. Because my book tells me to let the man drink. If he hasn't got a good case of the jitters, let's get him drunk and see if that works. And if I give a heroin addict a loaded needle of dope, from my understanding, I absolutely know nothing about it, he's going to OD and die, possibly. You know? And, and I tell these young guns, man, stay in the primary purpose. We can't save them all. God, I wish we would. In the early 90s, we had all these rehabs coming in and in and in. Oh, my God, the problems. They started bipolar. They started this. They started all this stuff coming in. And I was taught we're alcoholics. And, and we gotta, we gotta have our primary purpose and stay there. The primary purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is to stay sober and help another alcoholic to achieve sobriety. You know, we gotta stay there. We gotta start teaching that stuff. But it says in that book, you know, we're gonna help other people. There are those who predict AA may well become a new spearhead for spiritual awakening throughout the world. When our friends say these things, they are both generous and sincere. But we of AA must reflect that such a tribute and such a prophecy could well prove to be the heady drink for most of us, that is. If we really come to believe this to be the real purpose of AA, and if we commenced 
to behave accordingly, our society, therefore, will probably cleave to its single purpose. The carrying of the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Let us resist the proud assumption that since God has enabled us to do well in one area, we are destined to be a channel of saving grace for everybody. And that was written by Bill Wilson in the 70s. Because in the 70s, AA started to get taken over by the flower children. And they brought their problems. And AA almost fell apart. And it was said earlier, you know, it, 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 we're doomed. And not just financially, it's spiritually. Alcoholics Anonymous today, in my, in my humble opinion, has become spiritually sick. Has become spiritually sick. We forgot our primary purpose. You know, I, I love this program. I love it more than anything in the world. At 11 years so, at 11 years sober, or 21 years sober, my brother died, committed suicide, came back from Afghanistan. I ended up in the nut ward. My 21st birthday in AA, I took a token I didn't want it. I drove to a bar and I bought a glass of whiskey and I was sitting in front of that glass of whiskey in a window, in that mirror looking. And I wanted to drink. But you know, Alcoholics Anonymous kicked in and I remember what they told me I had to do. And it said, I had to ask God. It was the only thing that was going to get me because no human aid could do it. And I looked up in that mirror and I put my hands out and I said, God, what would you have me do? And this fat woman came over and she grabbed my whiskey and she picked it up and she drank it down solid. And she looked at me and she said, you don't need that. I know there are angels. And I know God listens. You know, and that angel's in this room tonight and I love her more than, more than most things in the world. You know, but this program's it. If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I want to welcome you. If I made you mad, good. Maybe you'll think about the book. You know, I don't apologize for what I say in front of anybody ever. Unless I hurt your feelings personally. But when it comes to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I make no amends. It saved my life and countless others. I hope you find what you need in Alcoholics Anonymous like I have. Believe me, I didn't say what I said tonight because I'm bitter. I said tonight what I said because I'm scared for Alcoholics Anonymous. My son's my son. He's 23 years old. He may need this place one day. And if we keep going the way we are, it won't be here for an alcoholic. It'll be here for everything but. You know, I thank you guys for having me here tonight. I, I just, I love to, I love to share what I know about the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, I know very little about it. And if you're looking on your apps to see things in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on your phones, stop. <laughs> because you're you're missing the context in which it's written. I've never underlined a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've never highlighted one. Because Jules and those old dudes said, "Don't do it," because the next time you read it, you'll miss something important. And I found that true. I just found out that all these years we've been looking at people's eyes change when they did the steps, and we see that light come on in their eyes, which means so much to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I just found out two weeks ago from a newcomer where that line is. It's in Bill's story. When Ebby walks to his door, he said there was something about the light in his eyes. This program's helped me, and it's, and it's taken care of me for over 25 years and a bunch of people I love. If you're new, please stick around and talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.